here with everyone here, what it, what it looked like that you led in devotions with your daughters and the, the big truths that were taught tonight before that time? Yeah, thank you, Doug, for that. So the uh, the devotion time, remember I said uh, consistency and brevity? So honestly, we didn't do anything complicated. So we, we basically would read through um, like a book of like the book of Philippians or the book of Ephesians or something like that just a few verses at a time just little bits I would just read a couple verses and ask them questions that would help help draw out some you know some insights from it sometimes they would have something to say and sometimes not you know it just depends with little kids and uh, and talk about some things you know really you could focus on does this tell us something about God does it tell us something about Christ does it tell us something about ourselves does it give us some promise that we can hold on to does it give us a commandment we should obey I mean just kind of simple things like that you can look for every time you read a passage you know and you pull out different things and then we would pray together after we talked about those and Jody had an idea um, that we followed was to use a notebook and record prayer requests leave a blank uh, where you could fill in the answer to it later uh, so we used blue pen to put the request and then red for the re for the answer and we kept these notebooks or at least one notebook I can maybe we have two I can't remember but anyway you can go through these and see all these answers to prayer that the Lord brought and um, just you know it's very encouraging to their faith and ours to see that prayer really matters you know and so that's we basically did that not, not complicated and then the big truths I again I of course I teach theology for a living so I didn't have to prepare you know that that's why I wrote the book for other people who don't do what I do right uh, they can use that but so I just would walk through doctrines of the Christian faith with them it took 10 years to do it you know to go through the whole thing but uh, and I always would start with a verse of scripture because I wanted them to know that our theology doesn't drop down from on high, as it were. It comes out of the text of Scripture. And so start with a verse, and they just kind of develop little bits of doctrines, and then move on to the next one. And so it took, took a lot. I was never in a rush. We just took our time. And my goodness, they had questions. It was really something to see how curious and interested kids can be if you give them opportunity to and kind of stimulate their thinking a bit. So that's... So, I, you know, you could use helps with this and do something similar with your kids and walk them through like a, a catechism, think, but think together about what's there or, you know, my, my book on that and read the chapter yourself first and then pick little parts of it to talk about with them. So anyway, mm -hmm. Jody, do you want to say anything about devotions? family devotions? Um, we didn't do it perfectly. Uh, we did not do it every night. For those of you who think we did, we didn't. Uh, we had seasons when we were more consistent and seasons when we were less and, you know, seasons when we forgot or life was just, just too full. That's okay. Get back to it when you can mm -hmm. and make it a priority and start again. Um, it was helpful that Bruce was a teacher. So the, the school year, the start of a new school year or a new semester always kind of gave you a fresh, fresh burst, a, a fresh mm -hmm. start. And, and so we tried to take advantage of that. Your, your visual aid, it's like the clamp mm -hmm. and, and then trust. Uh, if a parent hasn't started with a tighter clamp and, and now their kids are teenagers, mm -hmm. um, how do you recommend course correcting? Yeah, that is a great question. So I do think just honesty with your kids. I think talking to your children is underrated mm -hmm. and all the way through. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's even when they're really little, explain things to them. I mean, sometimes you just have to, they just have to do this because you say so. You know, parental authority, that's fine. That, that's true sometimes. But most of the time, you can explain why. And so, so they can, you know, grow up with an understanding of, Mom and dad know what they're doing, you know. They, they have reasons for these things. And so I think what you can do with older children where you, you kind of, a course correction is needed, is just be honest with them and say, you know, honestly, we've learned some things about, about how, uh, you know, parenting should go as, as it's described in the Bible. And uh, we've, honestly, we've made some mistakes. I mean, we did that with our kids. We talked about mistakes we made. I always apologized when I, you know, did something that was wrong or misinterpreted something they did and scolded them for it and then found out later that I, you know, I was just 
off base completely. So apologize to your kids, be honest with them, and just tell them, let, let them know your heart's desire is for their best. And what we think is best for you now is to make a movement in this direction. And so just lay out for them some ways in which you're going to make some changes in your home, do th- some things differently. So I, that's what I would recommend, and, and then implement it. And pray that God would give them hearts that would be open to it. But don't make too many. <laughs> keep it keep it simple and focused. Figure out on what's more impo- most important right now for where our children are and the issues we need to deal with. Don't just overwhelm them and do this drastic course change. That probably wouldn't go very well. Mm-hmm. So back to the the early years, as you are seeking to clamp down and and with consistency, uh, what sort of, of offenses warrant spanking for, for children that are two and three? Yeah. Well, I think uh, lying to you, if you fi- find out, you know, the um, were you there or did you do this? or you know, And just you find out it was a lie. This is a serious matter, and you call, call them on it, and I think that, that warrants a spanking. If it's uh, something really mean to a sibling... Um, that they do, that that warrants a spanking. I think I think just serious matters. You do that. You don't spank for everything, and and uh, but I do I do think it's something that you ought to do uh, when it when things are important. We would keep a wooden spoon on the top of our refrigerator with the handle poking out so they could see it. <laughs> And sometimes all it would take was a glance, you know, up up at the spoon when they were little, and they got the point. They knew that, and I, I do think, by the way, a wooden spoon is a good implement for spanking because it does give a sting, you know, uh, and and yet it doesn't cause uh, bodily harm, and uh, so I I I think that's a good thing. I, there are some kinds of things that could be harmful. You know, a strap, if it, you know, so anyway, you've got to be careful in how you do it. But I wouldn't use your hand. Actually, your hand can be more forceful than you think. Um, so I think a wooden spoon is probably a, a very good thing to use. But just be measured in that and, and have other things in mind uh, that, that you can use, withholding things from them that they really like for a period of time, uh, just to help them get this and that sort of thing. But anything? Okay. So even mentioning lying as, as one of those um, sins that that is dealt with, uh, with yeah. spanking. What how how would you advise someone to um, not discourage their child um, from truthfulness in the future? Mm. You know, by disciplining a child for lying in it without discouraging mm. truthfulness. Well, of course, the point of it is to encourage truthfulness because of the penalty that comes to you from lying, right? Right. And, but then along with that instruction that goes, I mean, God always tells the truth. Aren't we so glad mm-hmm. that God always tells us the truth? You don't ever have to worry that something he said to you is wrong or that he's lied to you. You can, you can trust his word, how important that is. And, and so we need to model that with our kids too. We, we don't, we, I mean, if you misspeak something with them and you find out about it later, uh, apologize for it. Tell them, you know, I was wrong about this. I, so th- this was one area, you know, my own dad, I've told you what a great dad he was, but this was one area he was really weakened. I never, ever once heard him apologize for something that he did that was wrong or said that was wrong when it was obvious sometimes he did what was wrong and he said what was wrong. It was clear to everybody, but he would never say so. I think it was just pride. I think it was. And uh, so I, I just it, that's just a huge mistake, my friends. It is. You've, you've got to be humble before your own children and acknowledge when you're wrong. And, uh, and, and, but please, be, be true to your word because that's one of the most important things you're training them in. So I think, you know, the discipline, the spanking discipline just highlights how important that is for them to be true to their word, to learn, to encourage them to be that way. Yeah. There are quite a few questions just related to, to discipline here. So even with spanking, if in how when the spanking is received with you know, tantrums or throwing themselves on the ground or, you know, 
oh. just just kind of a chaotic environment. What? How do you advise parents to to handle such a situation? I I am sure there are some children and some situations where tantrums are unavoidable. I think most of them are avoidable by training them this kind of behavior is not uh, acceptable. And severe, severe discipline with them so they learn they cannot do this because really most kids who go into tantrums, they're just doing this to get their own way. It's just a, a power play on their part. That's, they're, they're sinners who want their own way and this is accomplishing it and it works. What you can't let them learn is that it works. You, they, they've got to be called on it, and in time, um, realize they can't, they, they cannot do this. So I don't, you know, spanking, putting them in their own room until they're done with this, but not granting what they want because of it out of a tantrum. Mm -hmm. I think that would be, mm -hmm. in most cases, I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions to things, but in most cases, that would be a big mistake. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I think it depends on if you start in a particular way where you, you win, as we've talked about every time, you probably, for the most part, are not going to get there because you won't have per you will not have permitted that kind of thing to go unchecked. Um, and if you nip it in the bud, was that Barney Fife? I don't know, but you know, you yeah. stop it early. Uh, it's probably going to help uh, from having it grow into something more like that. But you know, suppose you're there now. Well, I think again, you talk with them and you just make it clear where we are not going to accept this any longer. And, uh, and then um, maybe let them act this out somewhere else, but you don't give in to them on this. And they're disciplined for it, perhaps things taken away from them for it, but so they learn not to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, anything? So. Okay, thank you. Here's a question about friendships. Uh, uh, how, how to navigate friendships for our children uh, when, when friends might come from other homes that oh. you know, just different worldview, different <laughs> dismissive of sins. <laughs> and like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. This has gotten so much harder. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry for all you young parents. All these things are much harder than they were for us. I'm so thankful to be old. It's wonderful. Mm. Um, I, I'm thankful to be married to an old wife. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but your commitment is to the Lord and to raising, uh, evangelizing, discipling the children that he has given to you, this stewardship, and that matters most. And that may mean at times saying or doing things that other people find offensive, and we just have to be okay with that. Um, we don't want to do that unnecessarily. We want to be as winsome and as kind and as gracious and warm as possible. But bad things can happen to your children because we don't want to offend somebody. I just read a great book this week by Julie Lowe on um, safe, uh, raise, keeping your kids safe, something like that. She's at CCEF, really good stuff. I would recommend that book, especially for those of you with younger children. Just the importance of keeping your children as safe as you can in, in all different um, arenas. But um, we, we just have to be willing to risk that, that offense. The, the gospel is an offense. The, you know, the truth is an offense to people. And so if, if we can't do something, if our child can't do something that all the other children are doing, we have to be okay with that. We have to help our children be okay with that. What matters is pleasing the Lord. One thing I've been so grateful for, um, my mother was very much a people pleaser. And one of the phrases I heard the most growing up was, what will people think? What will people think? I heard that a million times. That's what mattered to her the most. What will people think? And my father, thankfully, thought in a very different way. And he would say, as a counterbalance, if only we knew how little people think about us, <laughs> which is really true. But then God in his kindness had me marry this man 
who cares so much about what God thinks that correspondingly he doesn't care much about what people think. And that has been so strengthening for me to really grow in caring what God thinks and giving that so much more weight. And as the culture just kind of falls apart around us, there, there's going to be more offense and more, more steps that we have to take to keep our children safe, ultimately trusting the Lord for all of that. So we just have to be okay with, with not being the popular ones or the ones that, that fit in and help our children learn that. May I make a, a comment? I, I actually have two things to say. The first thing is I want to apologize to my wife in your presence because I said this publicly. I, that little comment I made it just wasn't appropriate. It was meant to be humorous, but it was just not, it wasn't appropriate. Um, I hope she doesn't mind being married to an old husband. That's, <laughs> that's what I should have said, <laughs> not the other. Anyway, I'm sorry, honey. I forgive you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the surprises that we had with this issue of other kids in other homes is, wow, it was just so disheartening to us of how many Christian families we felt like our kids could not be with mm -hmm. because the standards in those other homes, many of them, we just felt were compromised in ways that our own kids were either influenced or you know, redirected in, in ways that we, or they felt conflict, you know, in this. So it even happens in the church. I mean, other families in the church. And so I think you just have to, as parents, uh, draw the line, especially when your kids are younger and they don't have the ability yet to, to kind of filter well um, what kinds of activities, what kinds of actions, what kind of words, what kinds of things they watch on social media, whatever, are appropriate, what are not, you you have to be their protector when they're young. You just have to be. And sometimes it can cause offense with other families, sadly. Um, but uh, hopefully, I mean, you pray that the Lord will help you get in touch with, you know, other families that have standards that are much more similar to your own, and, and you can find, um, you know, just a, a real rapport with them. You do hope so, you but pray for, you pray, pray for, for that, yeah, friends. right. And then over time, I mean, as they get older, you you do train your kids to be to be careful critics of things out there. So I remember times when our girls would call home and say they're what they're watching this movie, and you know, so either we'll pick we yeah we pick them up or you know try try to have them do something else or something like that. So it's tough. I you know it just is, especially if you're you really are conscientious about. Um, you know, raising your kids in a particular way, it doesn't mean other people have those same standards, sadly. So, Something else that makes this tricky, you want to have a strong sense of how your family does things. This is what our family loves to do. This is what we value. This is what's important to us. At the same time, you don't want to engender in them a judgmental spirit toward other families who yeah. do things differently. Right. That's really, really hard to walk that fine line. So um, I, as they get older, you could talk about that too, about different families see things differently. But this is what our family does. This is what we're committed to. If I, As Bruce said, talking to them, just talk, talk, talk. Mm -hmm. And listen. Here's something I heard early on. Listen to them when they're two so that they'll talk to you when they're 15. And, you know, when they start to talk and it's just driving you crazy, question and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, but listen because you want them to keep talking to you, even if it's late at night, which it often is when they're teenagers. And I like to go to bed at 9 o'clock. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for... for Last few minutes on that, that was so helpful. Um, to what degree can we as expect our young children to not develop resentment <laughs> from being corrected in love before they become believers in the Lord? Oh. They're not born Christians. <laughs> they're selfish. They're prideful. They must be born again. So. Right. Yeah. You know, there actually is a movement out there um, that would argue that until they are Christians, you shouldn't demand obedience from them. I think it is a horrible idea, and actually unbiblical. Train them in, in the way that they should go, and when they're older, they will not depart from it. I mean, there's principles like that throughout the Bible. So, but you do want you you do want to help them not become legalists. Mm -hmm. 
namely by thinking that by doing by being a good girl, by being a good boy, you know, I do doing the right things and learning to obey mommy and daddy, I'm fine. Oh no, you're not. So that's why you remember I mentioned attitudes of heart? That's why it's so helpful to talk with your children at times when you see begrudging obedience. Because there you realize this is a matter of the heart. So you can, I won't repeat everything again, but you, you, you can call out that reality and God has to change your heart. So help them to, to learn, no matter how much they have learned to obey, this doesn't mean that they're believers. They have to, they're sinners that have to trust in Christ, repent of their sin, and so on. And uh, so, yeah, don't, don't interpret, um, you know, a home that's ordered with everything is right spiritually. Don't make that mistake. You know, we, we have one granddaughter right now who just, I mean, my goodness, she is such a good girl. But we have to remind ourselves often that uh, she needs the Lord like everyone else does. And, and uh, she has become a Christian now. She, so we're very grateful for that. But don't interpret good behavior as, uh, as spiritual uh, maturity or something like that necessarily. How do you no. talk about the gospel with kids and praying for their salvation? Yeah, so, and I think, uh, you know, talking about the gospel with them from a young age is a good thing I mean, because we do want our kids to come to faith soon, right? We would want them to come as soon as the Lord, <clears throat> the Lord enables them to do so. So help them understand the nature of sin is, is both heart and hands, right? It's, it's both attitudes of heart that we have and things that we do or don't do and, um, and just walk through their life with them and talk with them about ways in which it's evident that they have sinned against the Lord. And the only way that sin can be dealt with before a holy God is either by their paying for it, everlasting condemnation, or Christ bearing their sin on their behalf. So uh, point them to Christ, point them to the cross, uh, encourage them to, uh, to humble themselves before, before Christ and accept that forgiveness by faith. So I think those are all things you talk about with your kids on a regular basis. Yeah. One thing we tried to be careful about was praying with our kids for their salvation. We prayed for their salvation. I mean, that's what we care about most of all as parents, right? But if we're always praying in front of them, it can lend to them saying they want to be a Christian to please mommy and daddy, right? And so we need a lot of wisdom here and a lot of discernment. We don't want to pressure them into something that is not what God is doing in their hearts. So that's one thing maybe to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Good. How about maybe when parents are not on the same page, even this one, seem, mm. this question seems to be related, uh, just advice for spouses of, of <coughs> immature believers or non-believers, like, uh, mm. advice in that, those settings? Mm. Yeah. Well, it is, it is really helpful f for a uh, a husband, a wife, a, fa a father, and a mother to be on the same page. And so you talk about these things together. I mean, the two of you talk through things. And, uh, you know, this is one of the places that, that the male headship comes into play if there's a disagreement, fundamental disagreement, on s maybe some way to exercise discipline or um, or what, what to do given a certain um, situation that has arisen then the husband bears ultimate responsibility in this. And so the wife needs to submit in that, which is not an easy thing to do, but, but that's what she's called to do. Uh, but how much better it is, and, you know, and hopefully far more often, if you can be in agreement together on, on the way to proceed. Plus, that's so much better for your kids so they don't end up playing mommy against daddy or daddy against mommy. You know, they, they learn <laughs> if there are differences. They can sniff it out. And uh, so I think having a unified front is such a, a good thing to do. Um, try, try to, you know, if you're young and inexperienced in this, get counsel from some others, some more mature parents, and uh, see if they can help you to sort through what would be best but um, yeah, for goodness sake, I, I think to your children, you would present a unified front, even if 
you have a disagreement, and you're going with now the husband's um, notion on this, the wife should join him as a unified front with the children. So they, it's not a division between them. Yeah. Unless he's encouraged her to sin. Yes. Right. Yep. We'll say that. Unless, unless your husband wants you to do something that is sinful. Right. You, you don't, don't want to have a united front. But let me just tell you, I have four older sisters, and one of them had a very difficult marriage. Um, her husband, when they got married, we thought was a relatively new believer. But after just a few years, he turned away from the Lord, turned away from his family, and mo actually moved out to the garage. He didn't leave, leave, but he lived in the garage, and for decades, the only communication he had with my sister, his wife, was either yelling at her or ignoring her, and that was all. And so she was basically a single parent. They have two children. He didn't go to church. He, he just didn't do anything that, that he should have done. And I watched my sister. She lived near where I went to college, so I would visit on weekends. And um, I watched her continue to do what she could do to serve her husband and to trust the Lord. And I never, ever heard one word of complaint or criticism from her for decades. So I pray for a different sister every day of the week, and I would pray for her on Tuesdays. And, you know, after 40 years, you kind of think, well, I don't think the Lord is going to do anything here. But he did. He did. I went to visit her, and she said, I have to tell you, God is at work in John's heart and had drawn him back to the Lord back to his family, restored a relationship, but it was it was forty years of misery. She she did not give up hope, and I just saw her cling to the Lord through that. Probably the worst marriage that I've seen close up, but it's never impossible for the Lord to work, and so we should continue to pray and trust and plead and hope and see if he might be pleased to answer those prayers. Only because of time. Do we, we'll, we'll end here. This is such good questions. Hopefully you can find some time to ask. Where's other questions you have? But we really do need to oh, pick up our so. children here rapidly. Let me uh, close us in <laughs> prayer. And then uh, feel free to come get some more food before you leave today. Uh, we look forward to 9.30 tomorrow morning will be session three. Uh, parenting in the auditorium. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we entrust ourselves to you. May we uh, just seek wisdom from your word in this vital task, this meaningful task of parenting. We do pray for our children that you would save them, bring them to saving faith even at a young age. We pray that they would serve you all their days, that they would um, grow up to be godly, make wise decisions. So we just pray for wisdom to characterize our parenting, humility to characterize our parenting. And so thankful for this context of this conference to think carefully upon your word on, on, on approaching this subject of parenting. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.